Welcome everybody. My name is Emily Giles and I am a graduate student in the art therapy program here at Mount Mary University and I'm also a student intern at Express Yourself Milwaukee this semester. I'm honored to be here today with the Women's Leadership Institute of Mount Mary University who has the bold vision to help women develop to their full potential as transformational leaders in their professions, their communities, and around the world. This is achieved by educating, supporting, and inspiring women to think more creatively in their leadership roles. The studio series allows for students to be inspired about their own leadership potential by inviting accomplished and experienced leaders to share their professional and personal insights. I am proud to be introducing an inspirational woman who, has, who greatly engulfs the Women's Leadership Institute philosophy of being creative, purposeful, and supportive through her work. Lori Vance has a license in social work and is a registered art therapist and also is a practicing visual artist. Along with being a Mount Mary University alum and past faculty member where she helped develop the coursework needed for future art therapists like myself to be successful, she continues to share her education and experience in the field of art therapy through many venues of hard work in the Milwaukee community. Her hard work has been locally and nationally recognized. Her experience stretches over 20 years and expands to working with children, adolescents, adults, and their families. She continues to successfully balance psychotherapy work at her private practice, encompass effective mental health services, and her work at Express Yourself Milwaukee, which she founded and co-directs. She founded Express Yourself on the belief that the power of artistic expression has the ability to change lives. Through her arts immersion programs, young persons learn to express themselves in healthy and positive ways and are supported to discover their inner strengths and connections with others. The focus of Express Yourself is on youth in the court system, residential care, and youth experiencing the challenges of poverty. Lori and her team of expressive artists have given learning opportunities to over 700 youths annually since shortly after their founding in 2001. Each year, the hard work Lori, her team, and the youth artist gets showcased in an art show and performance at Alverno College. After meeting Lori and being able to experience just even the small amount of interaction she has with her staff at Express Yourself and with the youth in the Milwaukee community, it is no surprise to me that she is being honored as a transformational leader by the Women's Leadership Institute because it is through her creativity, helping others find purpose, and giving support to those she works with. She is positively reshaping the lives of many, including myself, to make a better community for the Milwaukee youth. Now please help me give a warm welcome to Lori Vance. <laughs> Nicely done. And, um, and very personal, as yes. we heard because of her work um, with your Express Milwaukee folks every day. Welcome to our, our audience. And as you heard, um, our conversation today with Lori Vance is really personal because she's one of us. She is a Mount Mary woman. And we really appreciate when our Mount Mary women come back and talk about their journey. Because I know for the students in our audience, sometimes it's hard to connect the dots, isn't it? You see successful women um, and we don't know always about the challenges, the hard work, the sweat equity, all of the things that go in to making a Lori Vance where she is in her life today. We're going to talk about that because I think it'll give you some insight into Lori, who's not only a great artist and a psychotherapist, mm -hmm. but a woman of great empathy. And I'm going to use that word because I think you're going to see that dot connection very strongly as we go about visiting and talking about your life. Right. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to use a quote that Lori uh, shared with me when we had a chance to meet and talk in advance for the, the program today. And she said, I know that people might look and say, how is it that there's this white woman who's leading an organization that deals with youth of color mm -hmm. and, quite frankly, with issues of race mm -hmm. almost every day? Yeah. And I think her backstory of her own childhood will give you some of a window into that. Let's talk a little bit about that part of your life, Lori, and that sensitivity mm -hmm. that really began at a very young age. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm the oldest of nine, and um, 
I have a culturally diverse family that I come from. Um, my, uh, I have six, six of us are biologically related and three of us are, uh, three of our family, my siblings are uh, of different races and, and each of them are of different races. And Your so parents have, adopted children? Yes, they did. So you had a really wonderful, rich, growing uh, upbringing and grew up with um, probably race conversations in your own home. Yeah, actually. Um, or maybe not as much as you would have liked. <laughs> yeah, actually I was having a conversation with my brother Adam who um, actually was born in Milwaukee and adopted into our family as an older child. And he said at Christmas, he said, so Lori, I would have thought you and Fred, my husband works also in the public sector, or in the um, nonprofit sector, and he said, I would have thought you and Fred would have adopted children. And I said, well, I kind of have in a different way. 700 <laughs> of them every year? Yep. Yeah. Um, and, you know, issues of um, race are part of my siblings who are now adults and have their own children, but it really is part of their life. And I know as they were adolescents, I was uh, older, I'm the oldest, and so I was very much part of helping them and my parents talk about those issues because it wasn't an easy conversation. I mean, my parents are wanted to, they love children and wanted to take care of children and that was the way that they could do it and didn't really consider raising a, a multicultural family in a very white, um, I grew up in Franklin, so, you know, mm -hmm. very white neighborhood. And, and, the, and your, um, your adopted uh, brothers, Sisters and brothers? I have a sister and two brothers. And were, came from what parts of the world? Well, I have a, my brother Nathan was adopted from uh, Korea when I was 12. And, and actually that was kind of an interesting age of questioning for me. And so I think that's what started um, my curiosity about what does that mean? We're all blonde haired and blue eyed and he came looking very differently. And, um, and then my sister Tuyette um, and my brother Adam are, uh, Adam is, like I said, from Milwaukee, and he's biracial, African-American, and Caucasian. And my sister is Vietnamese and African-American and um, came during, you know, I grew up, or in high school was studying, you know, Vietnam was going on, and so that was a whole nother dimension. Uh, so you have this wonderful family quilt, yes. if you will, and, and no doubt, as you said, opened your eyes, maybe not right away, mm -hmm. but as you began to think about your own personal growth and the things that interested you in life. Mm -hmm. How did that help inform you? Because we talked a lot about, I think, um, I, I wrote down something else you said that I thought was really instructive. You said, art can inform so many other things in life and that it can open up a conversation and thinking. Right. And it obviously um, informed you, even as a child. Right. I mean, I was always, um, my mother would drive me down to the art center uh, for, sun, for classes with Miss Chris. And, uh, um, you know, art was always a part of my life. And in high school, when I was grappling with who I was and how I fit in, uh, my art teacher was one of those mentors in my life. And um, then again, in college, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, art was the place that I went to to feel grounded and, um, and to understand myself. And also it w was really um, being the oldest, I think I'm a pretty serious person and art was a place that I could play and feel um, kind of ease because I had some uh, ability in that, you know, that was mm -hmm. supported at least. Um, and so that was also a place that I could play. So in, in my life personally, art was the a resource for me. And then I met an art therapist and that just lights went off in my mind like, oh, I could do this, I could help other people and... And make a living at it. Right. At least we try. And in art, sometimes you have to work a little harder yeah. at it, right? And yeah. you have to convince the people around you yes. that this is a sustainable existence. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm still working on that. <laughs> so, so you ended up as a high school art teacher. That doesn't really surprise uh, many no, people. No, I, I wasn't. Or you were, she was my mentor. She was your mentor was your right. high school. was high school. So that was, that was a real key turning yes. point, a pivot point, as you would right. say, in your life. Right. Is that you had great, a great mentor. Yes, I did. Yeah. How did that? How did that? Um, is put you on that that art path? Well, she was somebody who um, I I was, and it's kind of interesting with Express Yourself now. Our our work is all in teams, but I was kind of a jock kid in school, but I didn't really fit in with the jocks, and um, and I liked the you know more colorful characters in my 
high school and, and they were tended to be art students and so I had these friendships in all these different areas and um, and she was somebody who understood me and and I felt uh, supported me in a confusing time in my life. Mm -hmm. So then we get to the point where you do move into the teaching world. I jumped the gun a little bit there that's okay. and that's when it, you moved into the university. Right. And tell us a little bit about how Mount Mary came into your life and, and also um, how teaching then became something that was really uh, another uh, obvious and, and really um, logical course for you. Right. So I started, um, I was a student at UWM, and uh, an art therapist was hired to develop an art therapy program at UWM. This was, would have been in the late 70s. And um, I met her, was totally turned on to this field of art therapy and what is it. And, um, and then she left the program, the politics of the program didn't uh, really take it, in, or the art department politics didn't take it there. And uh, also parallel at that time, I was involved in um, student government at UWM. I was um, part of Students for Positive Change, which was this multicultural group of radical students that were going to be progressive and change the university. <laughs> and, um, but then I, also, I found art therapy. I actually went out to county um, and met with Edna. I can't think of her last name, but she when I heard about this field and thought this fits, and I went to see her, and she had this like massive keychain of keys and she said really the only difference between us and who's back there and this was before um, they unlocked and released um, uh, psych patients into the community now we have a lot of those people serviced in in the community services but um, at that time people were locked and in locked wards it was pretty scary for for mental mm -hmm. health um, and I went in and she rolled out this long roll of paper and I and a big bucket of drawing materials and said, okay, well, you can get down there and draw with people, and I did, and it was really exciting, and um, sorry, I'm following a little tangent there, but um, then this art therapist left UWM, and Mount Mary had a program. At the time, it was an undergraduate program. Wisconsin had uh, undergraduate licensure, which was kind of ahead of the curve in the country um, at that point. Um, graduate level education was really the way that art therapy was moving and I knew I wanted to work in this in psychology I felt like I knew that I needed to get a graduate level education um, but I knew that Mount Mary w had clinical opportunities and so I came here did everything I could at UWM and transferred to Mount Mary um, my senior year and then that's when the Art Therapy Institute started here which was like a next step towards a graduate degree um, and I so Mount Mary was was reading the tea leaves in terms of what was happening with the right. industry and w and was yep. staying a, a, right. a, a in front of it right. and so really I was, being a pioneer in many ways. Yep. So I was part of the first grad or the first institute group that went through, and um, and then as soon as I left that, I went to back to UWM to get a degree because I knew I needed a master's for licensure, mm -hmm. and it was shortly after there that I was hired here. And you still have friends here today. I do. I, I, I'm seeing a lot of <laughs> nodding in the in the audience here. Loving, loving friends. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, and and what um, what were your best memories from Mount Mary? You mentioned uh, one of the sisters. Was it that, that, or there was somebody on the front end here with the big wad of keys? Um, there. So there were oh. clearly people here who saw your potential. Right. You were young mm, I when was. you came here. I was 24. <laughs> and it's Crazy. hard to be taken seriously when you're 24. <laughs> Absolutely. You're clearly, uh, you know, you clearly had the intelligence and you had the enthusiasm. Sometimes it's hard to get people to yeah. buy into that, but, but they did. Yeah, so Sister Ellen Lorenz was oh. president at the time. And, um, and I remember, you know, going to faculty meetings and being like, oh, my I don't know if I fit in here, and yet I had like an open door to Sister Ellen to make sure that the program was meeting the national requirements and um, that we were in line with, so that students that went through our program, um, it was an institute at that time, and there was some questioning about institute programming and whether that met the credentials needs for registration, and so I just felt like, well, they, the college needs to keep engaged in that conversation. So people from the American Art Therapy Association and the college here, we coordinated a couple of meetings so that that was all clear and in line with the credentialing needs so that the students could graduate. And then Lynn came 
and um, Lynn Capitan. Yeah, yes. and mm -hmm. Lynn and I had some great times together. We had our first baby, or my first baby, her second baby together, and uh, and at the same time we're creating the graduate program together. So wow. that was really. Well, funny. if you had sister, if you if sister Ellen had your back, you were in very good hands. That's right. Because as we know from uh, sister Ellen's leadership here, she's she's awesome. And yeah. Many women have uh, cited her as a as a terrific role yeah. model and, and coach, if you will. So you talk about how you helped create the program. You mentioned Lynn specifically. You said one of the things that you learned is team. How mm -hmm. important team is in this particular line of work. I'm sure our students are learning that also. Talk a little bit about the about just the path of art therapy, the growth of it, how the industry sort of has helped you kind of always keep yourself current mm -hmm. and, and, and how that um, how that can be helpful to our students who are in the room today as well? Well, I think in, inherent in art therapy are two really strong uh, disciplines, art and therapy. And so you have to, just to be an art therapist, you have to constant, or I have to constantly be melding those two very uh, profound and deeply studied schools of thought and discipline. So it's just inherent that you have to work together <laughs> inside. And then, um, you know, at the time that I was an art therapist or entering the field, I'm still an art therapist, um, it, you know, it was a new field. And so we were always having to figure out, well, how do we fit in and how do we not intimidate people that might think um, what we're doing makes sense or doesn't make sense or might be walking into their territory. Mm -hmm. So team and collaborative work was always something that I've had to figure out. And I think I think I also knew that just coming from a big family and um, you know, my work as a as a student in student government, it's like we can't I can't do this alone. Whatever I'm doing, we have to do together. I actually appreciated talking to you uh, last week. I was thinking, well no wonder Express Yourself is so complicated in all these different institutions that we go in because, you know, that's just how I always thought, well, that can happen. Well, those people can talk to those people, and then that could work together. And that was really, you know, just kind of rooted in who I am, I think. And the nature of, 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 of having to help people understand what an art therapist does, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. When you were so into something new, yeah. I'm sure there were people mm -hmm. scratching their heads saying, art therapy? <clears throat> what is that? And how do you respond to that? In What's a, what's a nice way that our students can help their grandmothers and their families and friends understand what an art therapist does, right? Yeah. You know, it's it's funny because I always I always believed in it, so it wasn't hard to talk about and I would ask, you know, well, so which version do you want? My <laughs> Edith Bunker version where I can wander around and tell you all the nuances or do you want the, you know, kind of I do art and I listen to people and we help them feel better about themselves. Or that's, a great, that's a great description. <laughs> yeah. And I think most people would have a pretty easy time understanding <laughs> that. Yeah. You talk about um, the, the kind of young people that you come into contact with when we look at sort of on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. um, when we talked earlier, you said it's, it's juveniles. Some of them are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about um, young people who just face challenges mm -hmm. in their lives. Let's talk a little bit about the kind of people you work with and some of the heartening things that you've seen as a result of that interaction. Yeah, that's a big question. So so express, you're talking about with Express Yourself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So Express Yourselves, uh, we're, we work primarily with youth that have experienced the challenges of poverty and a lot of different dimensions of that. Most of the youth that we work with have some kind of trauma. I think their environment is traumatic uh, just in and of itself to hear gunshots constantly is really a hard place to be a child when you have to have that kind of alertness and awareness of your surroundings. Um, we work with kids ages 7 to 21 and we work uh, with contracts with agencies who serve um, kids that are in corrections. We go into the detention center uh, weekly. We work with full juvenile corrections. Um, we go up to Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake, which is a um, the secure facility for youth. We also work with the kids in Milwaukee County. There's a new, new program called MCAT, Milwaukee County Accountability Program. We offer programming there. 
uh, which is a secure corrections alternative. It's like the step before um, Lincoln Hills in terms of severity of what their uh, issues are. We work with kids in shelter care and residential treatment. Um, and then we also work with kids in alternative high school programming. And what, as the program grew, we recognized that kids are moving around these systems. And so our growth was pretty deliberate about accessing kids at different points in the system as a bridging agency. And uh, one of our newest programs is with the state of Wisconsin in a reentry. Uh, when kids come out of corrections, the goal is that they don't return. Um, and we, we are now a community engagement agency that we're part of their return programming they do with us in our studio. Um, so there was more to that question. Well, in terms of the kind of young people that you're doing, you just mentioned a, a lot of trauma, uh, some of the depths of which we can't even fully appreciate, right. um, multiple kinds of trauma, right. whether it's um, whether it's violence in their own families, as you said, in the neighborhoods in which they're enveloped. Um, but um, some of the stories of some of the young people where you feel that you've had an impact, uh, the, the ones, the stories, a few stories that really rise um, in your memory. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, I guess one of, one of the, the first one that comes to mind is a young man who I just saw a couple weeks ago who worked with us, uh, he's now in a, in a full corrections facility, um, but worked with him when he was younger. Um, very complicated family situation um, and is not doing very well really by external standards. When he's with us in our groups, he, he actually performed with us a few years ago and now is not able to do that. Um, but when he's with us in a group, He's totally connected and engaged and positive and interactive and respectful. And I believe that the seeds of what we're doing help open that up so that kids can be more who they are truly inside, which are beautiful, playful um, possibilities for, for future. And that's what I really love about Express Yourself is that when we're working with kids, all the stuff that they did wrong or what's not working in their life is present and we're conscious of it, which is where the art therapy part comes in. I mean, I, our teams have uh, skilled professionals that know how to not pretend that that didn't happen, because that's naive, but that that's not what we're working with, that we're working with really the strength and the resilience in the, in the youth that we're working with. And we believe that they can get along with each other and that they can help each other and that they're resources. And so that's really exciting to me. Well, another kind of success story I guess I can share is we have um, a young man who worked with us in one of the alternative schools. The kids in the alternative schools get there by being not cooperating effectively or not standing in line enough in the in the general high schools in, in the city. And in Milwaukee, if any of you have been in Milwaukee schools, that's a pretty wide range. Mm -hmm. So they have some challenges to learning and to being um, engaged appropriately in a school setting. Um, anyways, this young man was um, known as the candy man, which I said, oh, <laughs> yeah, I sold candy bars out of my, my locker. I'm like, mm -hmm, okay, I got it. <laughs> um, and we didn't need to go any further. But, mm -hmm. um, but then he was in an alternative school and worked with us for two years just as a youth in that program um, and then became an intern. We, ha we hire high school-aged interns to work with our program and we hire kids that we work with, so kids coming out of shelter or kids coming out of these alternative schools, not necessarily working with what um, would be considered the cream of the crop, but kids that need extra support to, to be who they are. Mm -hmm. um, and then he uh, is now, he works with us um, on a, a, as a mentor, that's as a mentor level. So that's a really exciting, and he still is struggles. He wishes he could go to college. His family structure doesn't have the support for him to be able to do that, and yet, um, and so he struggles keeping himself on the on the street, on, on mm -hmm. the path, mm -hmm. um, but I think that Express Yourself has really helped him um, kind of remember who he is when he forgets. Mm -hmm. Another uh, young man who's going to school in Iowa right now who worked with us, and he just, I know that Express Yourself helps him to remember who he is when he, you know, really struggles with anger issues, mm -hmm. and, you know, the Holly's suggestion to, you know, go to your song, go to your writing, you know, go to your drawing. I just saw he's a, uh, uh, posted on Facebook a, 
a drawing that he did that's beautiful, you know. Mm -hmm. When we were working with him, he wasn't drawing like that, but mm -hmm. I know that the roots of that were in his work with us. There's been like a, a, a fairly um, heated debate in our country about um, youthful offenders. Mm -hmm. Uh, people who say we lock them up, we, if, we, if they hit a certain age, we put them in with the adult population. Mm -hmm. And I think you and I no talked this. about the, um, <laughs> the idea that that probably is one of the um, least successful um, approaches. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yet I'm sure you get asked, how do you measure? Right. How do you measure what it is that you do? You, you know you transform lives. Right. Sometimes that's a difficult thing to, to quantify. Right. But how do you respond to that when, when people say, well, this is a young man who had a, a violent you know, episode and, we're, and, and, and we have to protect society from teenagers who um, could, can, do commit what would be you know, heinous or, or violent mm -hmm. crimes. Mm -hmm. Um, but you see the potential you set mm -hmm. rather than to, to lock them up. Mm -hmm. um, and even when they're locked up, you still see. You're still going in there and trying to yeah. see what you can do to unlock something. Well, and I'm privileged to be able to do that. I really do feel that because I wouldn't want to be a guard in a detention center or a full locked facility. I have great respect for them. That is mm -hmm. not a, an armor that I want to walk around wearing. Um, and yet I think it is necessary in some situations. And, and really, we just got back from um, the uh, Lincoln Hills in Copper Lake, which is in northern Wisconsin. It's the full juvenile corrections facility. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, I was on the governor's committee to look at the corrections issue for juveniles. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when, you know, the kind of the main challenge around the decision that was made, which was, if for those that aren't familiar with it, we, uh, there was a juvenile corrections facility out in Delafield, I mm -hmm. think, or something mm -hmm. that called Ethan Allen, mm -hmm. and there was a decision to close it. And along with that decision came the decision to also close the girls' facility, which was in southeastern Wisconsin. And about 70% of the youth in full corrections are uh, from southeastern Wisconsin, Milwaukee and Racine, primarily. Um, and the main kind of argument from the, our, our city, which I totally agree with, is that the parents don't have access to their children while, and, the, and what's happening with them. But the sadder thing for me, coming or being, being up there, going to visit, is that the divide between um, the northern rural communities and the southeastern urban communities is greater because of that decision. It's a, it's a more of that's who, you know, those kids those or kids. those people. And, mm -hmm. Right. And so it further, instead of informing us and helping us understand each other more, it, it's actually made it worse. I feel like that's a, a, a deeper uh, social ill. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that going up there with a team of professional artists that have you know, very clear goals about why we're there and are respected by the staff there um, for our professional engagement helps to shift that because we are a diverse team of people. We, we um, are diverse in a lot of different ways as a team when we're up there and we're consistent. We've been going up there now at six years, which is pretty amazing mm -hmm. to start to shift that, but you know, once or twice a year with a small little team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody was telling me, Munir, one of our artists was, I think it was him, talking about um, the butterfly effect, that if you know, a butterfly moves in South America, that it can cause a tidal wave in some, I don't, I'm not remembering <laughs> the specifics of it, so I just keep telling myself that <laughs> when I get discouraged. <laughs> but to measure that, how do I answer the mm -hmm. question? Sorry to divert from that. Um, so coming back, I was feeling really kind of like, oh, is this really, are we just blowing in the wind? And you know, what are you thinking? And because the tension, the racial tension is pretty intense. And, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we got, the next day we got this newsletter and the kids clearly had, they had quotes from the kids about what we did and what their experience was. And I was just like, oh my goodness, this is everything, like I could just line it up with our organizational goals. And each, each of these quotes was just talking, I felt, I felt free for that hour and a half. I felt peaceful inside. I felt like I could work together with other people. It was exciting to watch 
other people do what they were doing. I mean, that to me says something happened mm -hmm. in that time and that's important. Um, and I feel, I, and I feel it is important to kind of understand the data about that and be able to communicate about that. And that's something as a small nonprofit, just before I came here, Daisy and I were working with one of our advisory committee, our council members who is a researcher about how do we accurately assess. We give pre and post surveys, but are we actually assessing what we're doing and the impact that we're having and how, you know, we spend a lot of time and energy to speak to our funders about what we're doing and to speak to the public about what we're doing and are we making a difference in, in kids' lives and how do we do that with integrity? I think it's really a, an issue that as an organization we're, we've been grappling with, we will continue to grapple with. We've had moments we were part of a citywide research um, project where we had an actual researcher come in and help us with that. And then the next year we applied for continued funding and of course that didn't come through because it wasn't a experimental research and so it's you know it's an ongoing challenge. From a taxpayer standpoint, you folks are a whole lot cheaper than locking young people up in totally. correctional <laughs> facilities. So maybe that's a good talking point for future funding purposes, right? Yes, right. Is that you are far better with resources right. and um, and as you said and you can measure, you can measure it. You said one of the other things that's helped keep you grounded is that you're, you still have your outpatient psychotherapy practice. Right. Keeps you sort of on the cusp of always what is happening in that and kind of pulls you back into that, that part of the world. Certainly the artist piece is the other one you're, mm -hmm. you're, you comfortably reside in, uh, but the, but the uh, psychotherapist uh, right. piece you said is also very critical. Right. I see about um, 15 clients a week. Um, and I've been doing that for 25 years, I think. Not that old, but yes. Um, since I left Mount Mary, I left Mount Mary and went to do a private practice because that's what I thought I wanted to do, and I did, and I still do. Um, and what I like about that, Express Yourself, uh, the model itself is multi-arts, mm -hmm. so we're, we have a therapist or an arts therapist as a lead in each of our groups, and then there's a dancer and a musician and a visual uh, poetry and theater and it's it's very out there kind of a, a, um, you know when you go into a group you're in a group and there's all these people watching what you're doing because we're in these institutions and you know it's a very out there kind of thing and my practice is um, a quieter more um, internal process which is also very much part of who I am and so the grounding for me is that it helps me just stay trusting in the value of listening deeply and and then infusing that into the work that we're doing with kids and understanding it at, at deep levels. So mm -hmm. they, they really mirror each other in a beautiful way. I know you said that when we talk about Lori's next act. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're still thinking about that because you love what you're doing. Right. Um, one of the things is being a grandma which you're very excited about, and um, that's that's wonderful. <laughs> but what? Where do you? Because I, I believe that people are kind of on these courses their whole lives to mm -hmm. continually um, grow and 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 feed the soul, mm -hmm. right? How do you think about feeding the soul as you look down the near mm -hmm. term, the short term, and even a little more down the road? Right. Um, it's interesting. I just this weekend did this intensive. I've been for my own exercise, I've been practicing yoga and I uh, do Nia dance classes, which is, uh, I, anyway, I did this intensive and so I've been dancing all weekend. And it was also this totally dense um, model and structure and, and it's actually training people to be teachers of Nia. Not that I wanna do that, because I'm, I'm just doing it for personal, kind of get balanced with my body. But as I was sitting there, I was thinking, oh, I get why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> because really the Express Yourself model, I loved when I started, um, started the work. Stan Strickland is a guest um, artist that comes here every year, and he's one of the co-directors. in. Uh, we have a parent organization in Boston, and he's one of the co-directors. And it was through him that I met Paula, who is the founder of the model, and it and we're really the first um, expansion of that model. And um, when I was sitting there in 
this Mia workshop, I was thinking, ah, express yourself the model, because it's really exciting in, in my private practice work. I do a lot of process work with people, and it's up to the person to put that together and make sense of it. In Express Yourself, it's that way too. The kids, you know, we're planting seeds in these kids' lives. But the model itself is really a beautiful example of both process and product, which I think as a psychotherapist that we st I stay in this kind of process place with people, but the really coming together for an outside thing, we do a performance every year in May, and coming together for that performance really makes us work together. We could, we could stay in, you know, well, I'll work that out later, mm -hmm. I'll work that out later, but if I've got an audience of 300 coming to see this mm -hmm. show, we have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so we need to put our stuff aside and fi figure out how to make it work, and that um, is really an exciting thing. And the model is, it does have a lot of depth and a lot of layers that I think could be articulated. So I don't know what that looks like, but that felt like that was bubbling up for me. Like, oh, okay, that's a really interesting next piece to put together. And anybody in a nonprofit arena has to always reinvent, right? right. Because, mm -hmm. the, the, like you said, the world changes, um, and now it moves at this rapid pace that we're all mm -hmm. trying to stay current mm -hmm. with. But when you think about what seems to be more of a conversation, a willingness to talk about mental wealth, me mental wellness. Mm -hmm. Does that help get at some of the work that you're doing? It's been such a stigma, you know, where people are dealing with, 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 with trauma, as you uh -huh. said, and, and th the idea that we can maybe have a conversation, whether it's through our new health care plan, whether it's just that p maybe people are, are, are more willing to venture out there. Um, there's been a lot of conversation in this community about the need for addressing mental wellness. Um, mm -hmm. would, would that help when we talk about the world of, of, of our therapy, that we could have more, um, a, a more robust conversation with our families, with our friends? Mm -hmm. um, well, certainly mental wellness is, yes, I mean, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like you're asking me something that yeah. I'm not quite understanding it's a because hard, it's yeah, I think it's just a hard place for people to go. Right. Because it is it is you're going to these dark places all the time with people right. where they're sharing things. And I think sometimes right. it's harder for people on the outside to understand that. Right. And so if I'm understanding what you're saying is that our mental health and well being is really not a an illness or a stigma, right. that it really is um, something that we all need to attend right. to. And I do think that art therapy really has been that for me in my own life. Um, and art is a way to kind of open the door to having those harder conversations um, or more, you know, if I'm, I mean, actually, if I think about this weekend, it was a very creative process working on deep issues but we weren't actually talking, it wasn't therapy, mm -hmm. um, but those concepts and those core issues were definitely there. And yes, I think artists and art therapists and have a lot to say and contribute to that conversation. And, Absolutely. and isn't Mount Mary now a creative campus? Isn't we that are a indeed. New, I mean, we, are we always indeed. have been. You're now naming it, that's right? right. <laughs> it's a little, that's right. We're a little more intentional about it right now, but you're right. We, we like to feel we've always been in that creative space uh, in, in many ways. Um, for our students who are in the audience today, mm -hmm. and they've been very poised on your, on, on your comments because you have had such a, um, an illustrious career and you're not done yet. <laughs> um, what are some things that you would share with them as they sort of think about where their art therapy lives could go or might go or where they can make an impact? Hmm. Well, one thing you said when we were talking was, and it was, I really feel very honored to be here because it coming back, I actually, you know, as a student here and then faculty and I was young and to come back and reflect on how Mount Mary really was a strong root that believed in me when I didn't even know they were believing in me because I was just too busy trying to figure out how it could work, <laughs> whatever we were doing. Um, I think that it's really having strong mentors and you know finding who your support who believes in you so that when you don't or when you're worried that which happens often still does 
for me to have those kind of resources to turn to and to trust yourself that you have something to give. And if you know, if it, if it resonates in you, in me, then it's, I've got to follow that and figure out how to follow that. And I think that was, you know, when I, when I came to Mount Mary as a faculty member, it, you know, it was, there was a lot of me that doubted, could I do that? I knew I was young. And, and yet I also knew that it seemed like the right thing. And, um, and then, you know, just keep listening inside. And, and also having structure, trusting the structure that's there. I think that was uh, something that I didn't appreciate about myself or, and about, you know, that was something that I was thinking mm -hmm. about in terms of Mount Mary. I didn't realize the structure was there. I was too much into my own rebellion and having <laughs> to figure things out. Um, but that structure is a good thing. It's not, it doesn't have to be restrictive. It's something to return to. One of the things we do in Express Yourself is we have a theme every year. So this year our theme is Step Up. It's bigger than we. Mm -hmm. and, and that when we get lost, when we're working together in the middle of our process, it's like the theme can kind of realign. That gives us structure. OK, so how does this relate to Step Up? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can make it relate this way. I mean, a lot can relate to it. But if I can figure that out, that structure really is there to support. Does that make sense? Make, absolutely makes sense. And that, as I tell our, our students, don't let age be something that holds you back. Where somebody says oh. you're not, you don't have enough experience, right. or you you haven't, you aren't old enough to lead. I'm like, excuse me. Yeah. But leadership comes from all different places, yeah. right? It doesn't, ha it isn't necessarily un where you're anointed to lead, mm -hmm. but that you can get started on something that you feel really strongly about and, and make a difference, even just to get started on something that you feel really passionate about. Right, and, and to really trust the possibility. Like it may, you know, um, we have a new program that's, uh, that's just trying to find its way, its form in another, uh, this year we just kind of bursted with uh, interest in the, in, on the county level for our programming. And, um, and so it's kind of like, how do I fit the teams into that? And it's like trusting that it's going to unfold. And my dream, I have to have my dream, but also my vision, or, or what my vision guides me, but what, what actually happens has its own path. And so I have to kind of adjust and adjust, but not lose that vision, because that also guides me. You know? And to not be deterred if somebody doesn't understand what it is that you're doing. Use it as an opportunity <laughs> to enlighten, right? Instead of somebody who doesn't get it. It'd be really easy to be dismissive of people who don't understand how art therapy is, you know, is changing and transforming people. But to say, oh, I'm so glad you asked. There's an opportunity right. to right. tell you a little bit about what I do. And, and I think sometimes to use that as just a, as an opportunity yeah. to talk more about it. Yeah, find the art in the obstacle, you know, what, what's there. Remember, um, you heard Lori say she was here at age 24. <laughs> So, and, and then we all hope we have a sister Ellen somewhere <laughs> <laughs> supporting us as well. Um, I think that is, that is our part of the program. What we want to now do is open up to some questions from you. We know that there are people in the audience who have questions for Lori. They may, they may want to share some things about Lori that we have not shared thus far, but we have a microphone <laughs> here and there. And we would just ask that you use the microphones as you ask questions. And we want a first brave little soul who will come and ask that first question. That's me. All right. <laughs> So I want to ask you, for you, what is your next step for Express Yourself? Do you want to expand it more, maybe help introduce a new chapter in another city or in another state? Where do you feel well, it will go? So we are actually uh, an affiliate of, we have a parent organization in Boston. So that decision actually isn't mine, although I'm very much in collaboration with the, uh, the director there. So. Um, I think that that vision is unfolding, what that looks like. I mean, it's certainly a possibility. We do have a, a project. It's not a full organization, but happening in London, uh, and Express Yourself in London. And so that is definitely a possibility. It's kind of floating out there <laughs> as that could happen. Um, in terms of the local organization, I don't know if this is a, 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 a politically correct answer, but really I'm working on being better at what we're doing. We have, uh, we did, we had a pretty big growth spurt in the last year. We have a number of new artists. 
Um, you know, I'd like to expand our capacity locally um, so that right now we are all part-time, myself included. Um, Daisy's here and she's, I mean, so it's really kind of crazy to run an organization with that level. So and you're I, stretched, you're saying everybody's right. stretched in, in the bed. And so really to be able to, to be solidly doing what we're doing and, um, and you know, I, I think we serve enough kids, I want to make sure that we're continuing to do it with integrity and with um, clarity, if that makes sense. So, thank yeah. you. Thank mm -hmm. you. And keeping a nonprofit moving forward, has many balls that yes. must be juggled, not it the does. least of which is fundraising. Right. But as you said also that while growth is wonderful, it has to be managed right. properly and, and so that you can see an eye for the future. Right. Because we know we can, you can be the flavor of the month and be the really hot nonprofit right. and then all of a sudden you're gone right. if you're not managing the back of house. That's so right. it's, it's, you're saying it's sort of kind of reimagining in some ways right. how you take, um, express yourself to that next place right and what that would be right mm -hmm. I mean I think we've we're really working on infrastructure for the organization we're working on um, really understanding how to train new artists when they come in what the relationship um, one of the things that I am learning more about as I'm less involved in programming is the relationship between the the um, kind of lead therapist position and the artist positions and what are, what are the realistic expectations. The Milwaukee art community is a really interesting community to be a part of and to, um, to engage. There's a number of youth serving organizations that artists that work with kids move between. That's very different from our parent organization. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really uh, interesting challenges. And, unique, and uniqueness just uh, to yeah. this organization yeah. in this city. Yes. How do we stack up when you think about Milwaukee as an art place? Well, I think we have a really vital art community. Um, it's I'm, I am really interested in the art that's happening around the city. I think we have a strong music community. I also think it's very Milwaukee, which um, there's kind of a. Let's see, how do I describe this in a loving way? <laughs> there's, kind of, there's kind of a, a weird. Um, Oh, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like there's, there is a, oh, we know how to do it. And so it's really hard. Like I keep kind of bumping up against glass walls or mm. something. And then you have to figure out, well, is this a glass wall? Or how do, what do I do with it? Or, is, you know, th those obstacles. So mm. there's a funny thing about Milwaukee in that way. Um, we travel to Boston, uh, and, or I travel to Boston annually for their performance, which they do a performance as well, um, at the Wang Theater, which is a huge... You know, it's one of the biggest theaters in the country, and they have access to a lot of uh, very large, uh, or largely, large isn't the right word. Um, you know, they have a, a wide talent range that are interested in performing um, and offering that kind of performance. You know, it's just, an, it's just a whole different culture uh, economically and artistically, and and also our parent organization isn't in the heart of the city, and so um, you know they come in from the out, from the suburbs, so they have a whole different demographic that they're working with than what we're working with. So that's that's interesting. I don't know. I don't know if that answered the question, mm -hmm. but it did. it did. We have time for another question. I think I see somebody getting up over there. <laughs> Good. <laughs> She answered, she asked, didn't ask one. Um, my other question was, um, with the art, the, with, um, the art program, do they actually expose the youths to study? Do they actually study art? Are they exposed to the whole art culture or is it just centered around their own art? We bring in um, professional artists are on our team. So in that way, we're working with design concepts and uh, as in visual art, they're working with professional musicians. And um, the, the challenge that we have is we're with kids for very short periods of time. But as they stay with us, their, their skill level, so it's not an education program. It really is an engagement working on how do we relate to each other artistically and how do we express that. Um, the performance is... You know, it's a professional performance. We have a band and people from Stomp come in. I mean, there's many layers. It's a pretty vital um, kind of artistic expression. But in terms of direct education, um, 
you know, like along the lines like field trips, you know, to the art museum, um, just information, right. pamphlets on sculpting or right. any type of art, uh, musical art, whatever, are they exposed, you know, to try to get them into right. maybe perhaps making a career of expressing themselves. Right. If we have that level of engagement with kids, we definitely, like we, when the 30 Americans was at the museum, we took a whole group of our interns. So at the intern level, yes, they're getting much more of that kind of expanded exposure. We have a, a new project with another arts organization called Artworks, which has a year-round internship program. And so at that level, kids are more involved. When we're working with kids in the detention center, those kids might, we might see them for four sessions. And then we'll see them again, you know, when they're in shelter care for a couple of sessions. So the depth of that kind of engagement depends on the um, engagement that kids have with us over time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that answer yeah. your question? And that kind of leads me to my other question. Yeah. Um, the success in your program, does it count or can it count towards good behavior when they're in correctional facilities or can they, through completing your program, can they be re-entered back into the regular school system? I know you said some are right. from alternative high schools. Can they use that as a stepping stone, a second start? Yeah, actually our alternative high school um, programming, they get credit for being in our program. So they're actually earning high school credits with us because it's a collaborative program with the agency. And our, um, like in the MCAP program here, that which is the secure facility here in Milwaukee, um, those kids are, it is part of their reentry plan and we are integrated into their programming. Um, our programming at up in, up, up in Lincoln Hills, that was part of my, and it's taken really a long time to get even that reentry process where they're coming into our studio to work. I mean, the, the goal of our studio is really to bridge kids so that they don't have to return to some of these more transitional um, facilities and that's with our internships too is like we're taking kids that you know we're in shelter care and we're saying we've got an internship or kids that are coming out of corrections we've got an internship program apply and we have the structure in our leadership team to help them be successful in their internship which is is job learning skills were um, so so it's yes that's in the vision and yes it happens and yes, the kids that we're working with have pretty challenging chaos in their lives that make that really hard to be actualized. But that's the vision. <laughs> okay, and then my final question is, is there a spiritual component to the program? Well, we, um, we are not, we don't have a religious background as, a, as an organization, but we start and end all of our groups in a circle. It is, I know that the artists that work there really work on their own kind of uh, personal grounding, and we end in um, with the song of Funga Alapia, which, and all of our groups, so there is a level of, I mean, certainly for me, Express Yourself speaks to a deep spiritual commitment, um, and I think that I speak for all the artists that are um, in our leadership circle for sure, and even in our ex expand expanded circle of artists that work with us. Um, we bring in multicultural kind of influences, so uh, the Adinkra symbol system is very woven into a lot of what we do. If you've seen our pop-up gallery on 34th and Lisbon, if you Google it, you can see the Adinkra symbol, Nikinen, I think, I can never say it right, but the, the symbol itself is about the twists and turns in life's path, with which, you know, so every group is really how do we share our humanity with each other. So if that's spiritual, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Definitely much. Did. Thank you. Thank you. One, one word, I would just say groovy. <laughs> yeah. good, good questions. Yeah. And we're going to need to bring our program to a close. And as you know, um, all of these interviews conclude with our Mount Mary signature questions. These five questions were uh, inspired by a questionnaire, once answered by a 19th century French writer named Marcel Proust that has been adapted many times over the years, perhaps most famously by James Lipton and inside the Actors Studio. Our Mount Mary version of the questionnaire comes to us as a collaboration between the Women's Leadership Institute, student advocates, and students in our communication for mass media. Okay. So these have been formulated by our students. They are quite fun and intended to be easy. 
We don't want to put you off after you <laughs> came all the way to visit okay. us today. But they can also offer us additional glimpses into the heart and soul of our speaker, of our, of our guest here. Lori, are you ready? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> describe your life using only a song title. It's all about that bass. About that bass. <laughs> What is I play the bass guitar. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. What is your biggest pet peeve? Oh. You know, every morning I come downstairs and the cupboard doors are open. <laughs> and I always have to like call them. I think, did I leave those open? So No. <laughs> is that a pet peeve? That's, that's all right. It, those, are, those are little annoyances that can, can drive us crazy. <laughs> what is the most unique class you've ever taken? Oh, I had a semester with, uh, actually at UWM with this art therapist, and I don't remember the title of it, but my title would be The Essence Of, and every week we had to come in with the essence of something, and they were weird things, like a park bench or a tree or your brother, or <laughs> and, and you had to do it without talking about it. And that was really mm. challenging mm -hmm. and, and really informative. I mean, it was made me really quest, really opened me up to a lot of different Processing things. Processing and thinking yeah. differently. Yeah. What is the most non-essential item you tend to always carry with you? <laughs> My purse is full of garbage. <laughs> And it's always it's a fear factor when I have to fly somewhere. <laughs> I'm like, what do I have to get out of here yes. so I don't end up in jail? Because right. it isn't meant to be, you know, something that scares people, but it could. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I never know where to throw things, so I just put them in my purse, and then I'm like, oh, what is all this? So stuff? if you open it up little, right now, what little, would uh, just just like receipts, like a gazillion receipts, mm -hmm. none of which, you know, I don't save the ones I'm supposed to save for my taxes. <laughs> I just have gas and. <laughs> What profession other than your own would you most love to do? At Mount Mary, we like to we call this our um, we have a, a, a shadow identity, as we like to refer to it. There's something else we really love and we're good at, but we don't necessarily Ooh. make it our calling. But something that you would love to do if it were not this. Actually, I th I think I'd like to be a scientist. I think my a scientist, like in a lab or something, doing doing research in a lab. So having that, again, that quiet moment that would mix and mingle with, with your other side. Are you laughing at? <laughs> I don't know if I could do it, but, but it, I actually <laughs> did take chemistry in college. I was like a lot of, like if I wasn't an art therapist, I had enough so I could have graduated with a Bachelor of Science. Wow. I just and we want more I couldn't women remember in the science, periodical so. table or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that was a problem in that profession. Lori, um, you have um, done a wonderful job of, of, of helping um, all of us understand how this beauty of art and therapy can be combined into a, a real calling in life. And it clearly has been a calling for you. We're so delighted that Mount Mary is, is woven into that backstory. And, um, and I want to just mention as we close out our program that we want to thank the uh, student advocates for the Women's Leadership Institute because they help make these programs happen. You know who you are. And once again, a very big thank you to Lori Vance for sharing her story with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. Be sure to follow the Women's Leadership Institute uh, on the, our website uh, for our next uh, studio series on April 13th, featuring peace activist and musical artist from Chicago, FM Supreme. Hmm. Sounds interesting. Yes. And please come back and join us. You can nice. be in the audience. Okay. Registration <laughs> is open, and we hope that you will join us. And thank you again for being with us today. Thank Have a you. great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.